Good afternoon. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, and, and so l let me tell you what our uh, agenda is for this afternoon. We have uh, up to 90 minutes uh, uh, available for this. The first thing that I'm going to do is bring everybody up to speed in terms of where we are in the budget process. Uh, and the decisions that have been made and the framework that exists, and then stop. And we'll have a question and answer discussion period about anything related to how we got to here and what it means and what are the things that are, that are on the, uh, the cutting block um, and, and our processes, et cetera. Uh, then we have a second piece, and the second piece is how do we deal with the academic cuts in the colleges? Uh, and we'll present that and then stop. I'm uh, confident that we're going to have discussion about that. Um, let's just keep it civil and uh, we could talk as long as we want to about the pros and cons of that or other ideas that you all have to help us get to the finish line. Then after we've had that conversation, uh, we're going to take a survey. For you to participate in the survey, this is an important um, address that you need to download onto your phone. And here's the other deal. We, we, we got 300 to 400 people in this room. Everybody can't be on Wi-Fi. It doesn't work. And so, uh, it, we will not be able to do the survey. And so if you have a data plan that would allow you when we get to that point to go off of Wi-Fi, be on your data plan for two or three minutes, uh, respond to the questions, then we'll see the survey results and they'll come up on the board and you'll see how uh, everybody weighed into the process. If we then have extra time and people have questions outside of the budget process that they want to uh, ask, Keyshore, this would be your time. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to stay as long as the room's available and uh, respond to any subject anybody has outside the budget process, but we will do that at the end. Uh, I know we have media here, and so for our TV, uh, newspaper, radio folks, I'm happy to be available at the end of all of that to answer questions and do uh, on-camera interviews. So, uh, so with that, we're going to get started. Um, who we have in the room, so let's, we'll move on to the next slide. This is our budget town hall meeting. Uh, we have most of our leadership team uh, in the room, Steve Folkart. Our CFO and Frank Einhellig are sitting down front. When we get to question and answer periods, I've asked them to be available to, to respond as well. We also have most of our academic leadership team uh, and our administrative council uh, as well that can weigh in. But if you all read the news leader, you saw a couple of weeks ago in a column, I said a CEO has got to be able to talk about the numbers. So I'm going to do the numbers presentation today. It would seem wrong to make Steve to do it um, after that. So. Let's get started. So it starts with uh, uh, the governor's budget that, uh, that he rolled out on the 1st of February. So I presume almost everybody in the room knows our operating fund gets money basically from two sources, tuition and fees, revenue that the students pay, or entities pay on behalf of them, Pell, Access, Missouri, et cetera. So the tuition side, which is about 66% of our income. And then the state uh, subsidizes that, and we get a state appropriation. It's a line item for both of our campuses combined. Um, and that's been about 34 to 38% of our budget. Now, if you went back 20 years, you'd switch those numbers, and we'd be getting two thirds of our money from the state and a third from tuition. But that's not the world we currently live in. And so a year ago, yeah, our budget year begins July 1st, so we are working on the FY18 budget. That's from July 1st, 17 through June 30th of 18. That's the budget we're working on. Where were we last year? The year that we're in now that we've got two months left, two and a half months left in this budget, that's FY17. So in FY17, uh, Governor's Nix Governor Nixon's budget that went through the legislature, was approved, that he signed into law, uh, allocated $91,649,000 to Missouri State University, all of our campuses. 
There's always a 3% holdback, so we get 97% of that. So we were expecting to get this year, the year that we're in, $88,900,000. And then we divide that between the two campuses, and each campus then makes out its own budget. Now, you all know that we had a withholding. We didn't get all $88,900,000. In fact, the governor, the new governor, uh, because revenue didn't hit projections, withheld $6.3 million from our budget, the budget we are currently in. We filled that with uh, reserves, one-time money, primarily from the president's office, the provost's office, the CFO's office, so that we didn't have to immediately make ongoing cuts. Because we allocate 100% of our money. We allocate in a budget year what we received in tuition last year. We'll assume we'll have that same mix of students and that they'll pay, and we assume, uh, um, um, and, and then we, we allocate all of the money from the state. So, so we ended up getting $6.3 million less than promised, but we were able to manage that without any kind of immediate ongoing kinds of cuts. So this year, on February 1st, the uh, 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 Governor Greitens rolled out his new budget, and higher ed took a 9% reduction across the board. Two-year schools, four-year schools, University of Missouri, everyone. So our 9% cut is right at $8.2 million, $8,197,000. Again, we only get 97% of that. So as a system, we were getting just slightly less than $8 million than we were promised last year. You know, so when you chase a rabbit here, so we lost six plus million last year, we're expected to get eight plus million less this year, that's $14 million we are down in two years. Uh, but we're worried about the ongoing piece now. Uh, and so uh, in the governor's budget, weeks, he has Missouri State receiving $7,952,000. After the 3% uh, withholding, we then divide that between the campuses through a formula our Board of Governors has approved. And that means the West Plains campus has a reduction in state appropriations of $468,000, and the Springfield campus has a reduction of right at $7.5 million. So $7,484,000 is the governor's proposed reduction for the Springfield campus. And we have a, a few West Plains people here, uh, but most of the interest in this room is on the Springfield campus, and so that's what I'm going to respond to. Chancellor Bennett is here. If you have questions at some point about West Plains budget and what they're going through, he could respond to those as well. So that's the first piece. Let's go on to the next slide. Now, so in addition to the state giving us less money, there are also certain things that cost more. Our property insurance goes up. Our rent goes up. We do faculty promotions every year. Uh, this will be year four of the full professor salary incentive program. Our utilities go up. But the biggest new expense we have for FY18 is that our contribution to the pension system went up 2.48%. So all of our full-time staff are in the Mosier's pension system and about half of our faculty are in the Mosier's pension system. And so we don't have any say over that. We get a bill and we pay it. And that bill went up $2,053,000 for, for the people that are in our operating budget. And so besides the $7.5 million reduction that we have from the state, we have a little over $3 million of additional costs for next year's budget that we have to deal with. Fortunately, we're in a much better position than many other universities, and that is because we're growing. And so we have over uh, $3.1 million of new money. 
most of it from uh, enrollment growth, some of it from how we manage our money. And so the $3.1 million of new revenue will be used to offset the almost $3.1 million of new costs. So that's a wash. So let me ask you to, to think for a minute about the importance of enrollment growth. If, if we were flat, if we had no enrollment growth, then we would also be figuring out how we were gonna fund that extra $3 million on the right side. And instead of our hole being $7.5 million, our hole would be $11.5 million. West Plains is dealing with that very issue because they don't have enrollment growth to cover the extra cost of Moser's utilities, rent, et cetera. Um, all universities in our state don't have that. So um, the University of Missouri, the University of Central Missouri, which are looking at a 5 to 10% reduction in enrollment, their budget issue is significantly greater than ours. So if we had had a 7% reduction in enrollment, which is about what University of Central Missouri is expecting for the fall, our hole would be $20 million instead of seven and a half. And think of the magnitude of the cuts we would be looking at if we're trying to eliminate $20 million from our budget, or even $10.5 million from our budget. And so the enrollment growth piece is something that minimizes the, the damage to the budget, and so we're now just looking to fill or deal with the $7.5 million reduction that comes from the state through the, through the uh, budget. Let's go to the next slide. So, we started off as we were uh, working uh, with our various uh, uh, constituent groups and our board, are there going to be some guiding principles that are important to us as we decide how we're going to handle this problem uh, of a state funding reduction? Um, and a couple of them are on the board. Uh, we decided uh, that protecting the university's core mission is really important, and that's uh, academic achievement, scholarship, student success. But we also decided that it was important for everyone to contribute to this. All units needed to contribute a part. Uh, our students will, would need to contribute a part, uh, and, and because we're all in this together to deal uh, with this uh, problem. Uh, another guiding principle not on the chart, I'm just going to read this to you, is number five. Affordability and access remain important goals of the university. Therefore, the university will not solely rely on increased tuition and fees to replace budget shortfalls. Um, and that's connected also to the enrollment growth principle uh, that we want to continue to grow because, I, as I explained in the last slide, there's much more positive about enrollment growth than enrollment shrinkage. And so we need to, as we look on this budget, uh, as we work on this budget, continue to focus on enrollment. So we have to continue to focus on doing things that bring students to us, uh, and, and we, we need to, to focus on strategic decision making. And so we have not done an across the board cut of every unit. Uh, there are some units that will there, there are new programs that we are working to add because we think that over time they will bring in additional revenue beyond their cost. A master's in computer science is one such example of that. We'll continue to, to work on improving our facilities and we'll continue to try to grow as a university. Um, and, and then the last piece there says all um, budget decisions will be made in a uh, transparent way. Um, and so uh, I have been to faculty senate, staff senate, uh, our student government association senate, the alumni foundation, uh, and ALC to talk about this. Uh, uh, we put out multiple uh, messages through the electronic publication on Tuesdays, in particular in Cliff Notes. But we thought that this was such an important topic that we needed to have a town hall meeting that everyone could come, could hear the same uh, uh, pitch that I've been giving everyone to, so that everybody knows where we are uh, and you can give your input 
and we can make the best decisions as a whole. Our budget process is set up so that ultimately uh, the executive budget committee makes recommendations to me and I make them to the board. But we also have a budget committee in each college that is staffed by a, a faculty member from each department and led by the dean. That reports up to the uh, academic affairs budget committee that uh, Frank chairs that then feeds into that executive budget committee. So our goal is to have input all along and all throughout that process, but given the magnitude of the issue we're dealing with this year, we thought it appropriate to come directly to you and just tell you where we are and what we've done, uh, and then seek some additional input as we uh, move forward. All right, let's go to the next uh, slide here. So the, the first part of the analysis was what additional revenue um, can we generate to help us with this $7.5 million issue. And there was a lot of conversation uh, in terms of uh, um, what what percentage, what piece should be borne by the students as opposed to uh, what pieces should be dealt with in terms of uh, budget cuts. And, you know, lots of um, affordability has been one of the key drivers of our growth. Uh, it, it, uh, if you ask our students, it is almost always listed as the number one reason they choose to come to Missouri State University. Um, affordability was Governor Nixon's hallmark policy. Governor Greitens uh, has continued to emphasize that as a critical policy of our state. The Commissioner of Higher Ed and the Coordinating Board continue to, to emphasize the importance uh, of affordability, as does the legislature. And we have a statutory cap on undergraduate in-state tuition because of that, the emphasis on that, that limits our ability outside going through a waiver process to raise tuition above whatever the consumer price index or CPI was for last year. So factoring in all those decisions and getting input from the board as well as our SGA leadership who are here uh, today ultimately concluded that we should uh, increase undergraduate in-state tuition only by the, the amount allowed under the statute and not seek to go beyond that through a waiver process. CPI last year was 2.1%. Uh, let's go to the next slide. When we look at that, so, so students right now are paying, the, if they're from Missouri and they're undergraduates, they're paying $205 a credit hour. We did a $1 mid-year increase because that was CPI from last year. We had not increased tuition last year in response to a, a, an agreement we'd made with the legislature and the governor in terms of funding. The agreement didn't materialize and so we went back and increased, the board went back and increased tuition for the current year by $1 and an $8 fee. Uh, for the, we, we did not collect that this spring, nor will, will we collect it this summer, but it will be collected beginning in the fall. Then the increase proposed is uh, $4 per credit hour plus an $11 fee. The students a year ago added on a $29 fee, which is funding the new health and wellness center that is being built right now. And so for students coming to us in the fall, that are from Missouri undergraduates, they'll pay $210 a credit hour um, and the student fees will be $503. Setting aside that student approved fee, which doesn't count under the CPI, by raising the fee and the credit hour, that's the 2.1% increase. That's the, that's the maximum amount under the statute that we can raise without, without uh, asking for a waiver. Let's go to the next slide. You'll see the numbers for uh, undergraduate non-resident students. The increase is a little over 4%. Next slide. Graduate uh, uh, increase is about at 4% uh, as well. A as an aside, we are the lowest priced graduate education provider 
And so we believe there is more room in the market to raise that price. And so we're at 4% there. And then finally, non-resident is, uh, uh, is about at the same piece there. So if we assume the same mix of students that we have now, and by all, uh, by all signs, we're, we will hit that. We are continuing to grow. Our enrollment for the fall looks robust. Then uh, that will raise $3.4 million. And I think we have that on the next slide. So here's our problem, right? We started off, this is our cut from the state that we're trying to deal with, $7.5 million. We've set tuition policy, and I would tell you the student government leadership is supportive of that policy. They recognize that it's important to preserve quality uh, of programs and services as well. They're not asking us to bear the whole uh, uh, issue by just by doing cuts. But so we're, uh, this would be uh, the fee resolution that we have presented to the board that we expect them to approve a week from Wednesday. That would generate $3.4 million of new money. So what's the number we now have to reduce or cut our programs and staff and supplies, et cetera? It's a little more than $4 million. By doing this, less than half of the cut is being replaced with tuition money. And I think that's an appropriate uh, that's an appropriate formula and, and recognizes that affordability remains a critical issue for our students. I would tell you that every other four-year university in our state, I'm going to set the University of Missouri aside because they haven't committed on this yet, and remember they have a significant enrollment problem that changes the nature of their problem or, or their budget issue, Every other university is doing what we are doing. They are doing the 2.1 and about a 4% for everybody else, so Central, SEMO, Southern, uh, Truman, uh, et cetera. So we are right in the uh, majority view of, of what the tuition increase will go up. Everybody's tuition goes up about the same percent. We maintain our place in terms of the affordability of other institutions. So. So now we're down to this. So, so the next step, uh, the next step in this was let's begin working on the reductions. And I started with uh, the non-academic side. And I asked all of the division heads, the vice presidents that report to me, to evaluate cutting their budgets by 5%. So student affairs, 5%. Development, 5%. Uh, 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 financial services, 5%. IT, 5%. Marketing, 5%, et cetera. And, and then we looked at all of those cuts and, and ultimately um, ended up, on average, cutting units by 4.9%. So some of the small units, had to do a, couldn't do a cut of that magnitude. General counsel, audit, diversity uh, had smaller level cuts. Uh, didn't make sense to cut development as much as some of the others because after all they're trying to bring in additional money. Uh, but all the big units all took a 5% cut. And then uh, I asked the provost, without going into the colleges, if he could uh, uh, put together a 5% cut off of his budget and he has done that as well. And so what we have in the next several slides is uh, the non-college cuts that have already been made uh, or going to be made beginning July 1st. And so we start with, we eliminated 20 open positions. For example, uh, Matt Morris uh, in administration has eliminated three custodial positions. That's not, a, that's not firing custodians. That's, those are three positions that are open, and we will readjust the workload to continue to clean the buildings. So 20 uh, open positions, all staff have been eliminated. Reduction in payroll expenses is a nice way of saying we've e either reduced people's uh, salaries or we have laid them off. And so we have laid off six staff members on uh, Springfield campus. Dr. Bennett has laid off three 
on the, on the West Plains campus. In addition, there are um, five people that work in uh, um, one of the international programs offices that have gone from 100% employees to 75% employees. And so that is what is mostly in the reduction of payroll. It could also include, for example, a retirement. If somebody retired making $80,000 and we rehired at $60,000, then there's a $20,000 savings there. And so, so those are the kinds of things that are in uh, the reduction of payroll. 75% of our budget is in people. It's in salaries and benefits. And so in any kind of significant cut that we do, people are going to be impacted, unfortunately. So then uh, kind of the other things uh, that you'll see up there, uh, supplies and services, that's across all divisions. Uh, reduction in travel, again, that's just staff travel, that's across all divisions. Reduction in, reduction in marketing support. Uh, facilities, custodial grounds, budget expenses have been reduced by $200,000. We did not reduce any of the central classroom upgrade or maintenance funds because we have to continue to protect and maintain our buildings in this, in this round of cuts. The elimination of the non-resident tax tuition waiver, that is a policy change that will impact about 35 students who are not getting the out-of-state fee waiver but whose parents, say, live on the Kansas side of Kansas City and work in Missouri and we're getting a tax credit as a result of that. That is going away. That saves $115,000. Next page. So now we're getting into smaller things. We've eliminated the Jefferson City internship program. We have only had a handful of students do that in the last several years, but there's cost whether we have one or 10. Uh, we've outsourced some ITV infrastructure. Jeff Morrissey could explain that if someone has a question. We will not have the Ozark Celebration Festival this fall. That did not pay for itself. Our office was supporting that to the tune of $41,000. Uh, we are eliminating the central funding for the Center for Community Engagement. The center continues on. It is now self-supporting. It got a big $1.3 million grant out of the Northwest Project work, so it continues on, and so doesn't need the central funding out of Frank's office any longer. Um, and then you'll see uh, a variety of other things. We had a contract run out on four billboards that advertised the university, and we didn't renew that. Next page. Summer commencement. We are, after uh, this one this summer, we are gonna to cease to do summer commencement. Our peer universities are not doing it. We believe that we can adjust and allow students that are close within three or six or seven hours from graduation in May to walk and then go on and complete summer school. We do have a lot of international students that are a part of the executive MBA program, and so we'll work with the dean of the College of Business to make sure there's an appropriate ceremony for them but we will eliminate uh, one of our three commencement services. Uh, we'll cut back on the public affairs conference by a day. We'll seek private funding to fund the D Veterans Day uh, breakfast and then a bunch of smaller reductions that if we want to continue those programs we'll probably pay for out of one-time funds. But the blue line there is important because all of these cuts before we get to cuts in, in the college uh, we have done $2,812,512. So that goes back to one of our guiding principles. We have asked the non-academic uh, areas and the provost area uh, to take bigger cuts than the colleges. And so if you look at the next slide, if we put that in a percent, well, actually, so this is, here's where we are. Oh, this will work. So on average, those areas that we just talked about, that $2.8 million, that's a 4.9% cut in their budgets collectively. All the division budgets plus the provost's office. That leaves a 1.2% cut for the college reductions. So I believe that we've carried out the direction of the board uh, in our guiding principles to, to work to protect the thing that is most critical, and that's the delivery of classes in the academic side. So let's look and see what the number then is. So, um, 
so after the uh, revenue growth with the tuition increase, we were at $4,061,000 deficit. We've now reduced that by $2.8 million in the cuts before we get to the college cuts. And we have a deficit left, an issue left to deal with of about a million and a quarter dollars, which, is a, which would on average be a 1.2% cut from the colleges if we did it across the board. So I'm gonna stop there, that's a lot of data, that's a lot of numbers, and uh, somebody up at top, find me a bottle of water, I would be much appreciative. Um, but I'm gonna stop there and let's uh, open it up for questions about the budget. So, so here's our framework, we've got mics that people are gonna walk around, I believe. Um, all of this to this point, we've shown this to the board, uh, the board, and we've shown it to constituent groups, and there's been a general consensus that this is our framework. The tuition is the right amount. We expect the board to approve all of that next week, as I said. The 5% cuts are significant cuts for each of our divisions and the provost office. Uh, the board has seen that and approved those level of cuts. And, and so the framework left for the college that the board has also approved is the $1,248,000 in change. So that's where we are. Um, and so let me stop. And if you have questions about what you've seen or you have opinions that you want to express uh, about any of that, this would be the time to do that. So questions? Anyone? Down here on the front? Uh, my question is, the economy seems to be improving and healthy, and I just wonder why the state revenue is down in order for that Governor Greitens reduced our appropriation. So the question is, why is state revenue down such that we're having to go through this? Uh, a couple of answers to that probably. Uh, one is in the last year, of an administration and everyone's term limited out and the governor's gone, there tends to be a tendency to want to fund as much as you can. So a part of the issue is we probably overfunded some things. Um, that's, my, that's a piece of the answer, I believe. Again, that's Cliff's opinion. Um, another piece of it is there were a variety of tax cuts that were passed in the last two years where it, their impact was underestimated. And so one of the corporate tax reductions was supposed to have an eight or a $10 million price tag, ended up having a $50 million price tag. And so, um, you know, we all like our tax bill to reduce, but when we reduce taxes, we also reduce services. And so a part of the services that are being reduced are higher education. Now I will tell you in the governor's budget, everybody's not getting a 9% cut. Uh, K-12 is getting an increase. They are fully funded and they are getting an increase. And so there are a variety of choices he made in what he thought was most important to fund and where he was gonna make up the shortfall. And higher ed is making up more than its share of the shortfall. What else? Hi, President Smart. Um, I just had a quick question. I was wondering which portion of athletics the cuts were made out of? So uh, the athletics cuts uh, are, are in a different piece. So none of what we've been talking about now um, uh, are affected by the million dollars in athletics cuts that were announced last week. Uh, athletics is funded on the auxiliary side. There is a transfer that goes into that. And uh, frankly, as a result of decreasing revenue from uh, primarily men's basketball and increasing costs from cost of attendance and the ESPN deal and a whole series of other things, athletics was uh, over budget this last year by over $2 million. And so what we are doing now is reducing that gap by half uh, through the million dollar cut that occurred in athletics. And then we're gonna have to interact with the auxiliary side and the foundation side to figure out how we're gonna fund that other piece. 
Um, one more question for you. You said that you wanted to um, do transparency with the budget cuts. I was wondering if you've released the information on how field hockey was ranked individually um, in each of the categories that the working group chose. So um, we, we are not going to reduce the individual committee members' rankings on that to, frankly, to protect them. We wanted to have some anonymity in that. We have released the the overall uh, ranking of all of the sports. Uh, and so at this point, that's, uh, that's the extent of the information we're going to release. We've released the entire report. Um, and um, a piece of the decision to cut a sport, could have picked any sport you want, a piece of the decision to cut a sport is to keep from crippling all of the other sports competitively. So in our athletic cuts, uh, we have already cut every sport budget from 7 to 12%. By doing that, we reduce costs by about $300,000. Additionally, for the non-headcount sports, we've cut scholarships by another $200,000. So half a million dollars in cuts in the programs that remain. If we were to take the $300,000 that we save, by eliminating field hockey and cut the sports again, that would mean we would be doing another 7 to 12% cut to men's basketball, women's basketball, football, volleyball, softball, et cetera, and we're making it so that none of our sports could be competitive. Neither our board, nor the task force, nor our athletic administration or I thought that was the right decision. Unfortunately, the fallout of that goes to one team who will no longer play here, uh, it was an awful decision. None of us felt good about it. We looked at every single option not to have to cut a sport. And frankly, given the magnitude of the deficit on the athletic budget, we didn't think there was another choice. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, President Smart, for all the work you've already done behind the scenes to help with everything. I have to say, I teach students who are heartbroken for their colleagues in the ladies' uh, field hockey. And it's really impacting the students. I have some students in my class who are in, on the hockey team. But I was wondering, in view of the fact that there was an appeal in this morning's news leader to think maybe there is still hope. And I would like to add a faculty voice to the hope that perhaps the ladies might be spared. Thank you. So uh, there are 17 women on campus that play field hockey. Everyone should know we are honoring their scholarships through graduation. So they are all free to continue on and graduate here with no additional cost. Um, Pauline, what I would suggest to you then, if we're not going to cut that $300,000 there, where does it come from? Do we, do we add $300,000 to the cut the colleges are to come up with? I mean, it becomes a challenging number. It's a, uh, if we put that $300,000 back in, then I'm looking for another $300,000 cut. Uh, thank so you. So I, I would just tell you that decision's been made and uh, we're moving forward. Uh, thank you, President Smart. Uh, quick question. I was looking at the total cost, the resident and the non-resident uh, total cost for MSU, University of Missouri, Truman, and MSNT. Okay. Our, ours is around seven thousand and sixty dollars. Mizzou is ten point seven, Truman seven point one, MSNT seven point seven. That's the resident, and the non-resident uh, for us is a factor of two. It's about fourteen thousand. Uh, Mizzou is two, uh, two, twenty-six thousand, which is almost two point five times the resident tuition, and MSNT is over three times the resident tuition. The point I'm trying to make is that it seems to me that there is much more room to increase the non-resident tuition from 4%, which is I think is an arbitrary number, to somewhat a bigger number, and thereby reduce the pressure on other and, and we would still be competitive. It, 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 it seems to me that you know, we are not going to lose too many students over that, that additional cut. Thank you. 
So, so we, we, we have had conversations about to what extent should uh, tuition be increased on, on those categories that were not capped statutorily. Um, and, you know, I would tell you there's no perfect answer to that. There is a, you know, there's a market analysis. Uh, a year ago, in part, I think, because of the kind of cesspool that the media made Missouri look like nationally, um, our out-of-state students dropped for the first time. And so um, uh, we are up again for the fall, but, but there, is, uh, there is still, uh, we think, pretty significant room for growth in recruiting students from the surrounding states, particularly Illinois, uh, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, et cetera. And so uh, we can certainly take a look at that again. That's a, that's a fair observation, and I, I appreciate that comment. Other comments or thoughts or questions? Right here in the middle, David. Um, I know that there are discussions about cuts on the academic side in the colleges. Do you have a list of the types of things that are being discussed that we could uh, uh, be presented here? So, so great question. Let's, uh, l let me hold that just for a second because that's our next topic. And so I'll ask a couple of deans to help me with that. Um, but before we get to, so uh, kind of the, the structure of this, our, our first topic is here's where we are, here's what, where, what the, board, uh, the board framework. Uh, we may go back and take a look at the tuition piece. We still have a little bit of an opportunity to do that if we want to, but this is essentially the framework um, on the non-academic side, but includes the provost office. And then we'll move to the academic side if we're ready to. Any other questions about this first piece before we move to the next part of the analysis? Okay, good, good. Well, then we'll roll right into uh, to that question. So, so here's the second part of why we're here today. I, I think the first part is just to let you know where we are and how we got there, and we've done that. The, the second part then is uh, no decisions have been made yet in terms of how we make the college cut. Um, and as, and as the colleges were working on that, so, so we have a budget committee in each college, as I said, that has is supposed to have a representative from every, a faculty representative from every department, also as a student representative uh, this year. And um, they are each working independently with their dean to figure out how that 1.2% cut, if they were all made evenly, is to be made. Um, and so, I don't know, Vic, let's bring, Bring a mic down, somebody bring a mic down, and I'm gonna have Victor and uh, Stephanie each kind of just talk briefly about some of the things that are uh, in discussion in your colleges in terms of cuts. So here we come. Stephanie, you wanna go first? Thanks, President Smart. So if we were looking for other areas in the budget to cut, the types of things that we would look at would be staff, we would be looking at our per course budget, our instructors, you're looking at operating expenses. Under operations, you would have things like perhaps travel, supplies, and if you have centers that are funded out of your operating budget, you would look at trying to make the centers self-supportive. So those are the things we would look at in Cobb. Anything else, Victor? Basically, what she said is exactly what we've been looking at. Uh, if you think about it, my college budget is $11.5 million. 91% of that is in salaries and benefits. So it doesn't leave a whole lot else discretionary. And what it comes down to is cutting operating budgets in the college, within the departments and the colleges, uh, cutting back on staff, cutting back on travel, cutting back on supplies. Um, and in that sense, making it not as nice a place to work. So with, with that kind of 
general background, and, 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 and the budget committees are going into, into much more uh, detail than that, um, each college budget committee is working, and, and through that process, uh, an idea surfaced that, uh, that came to the executive uh, budget committee at our last meeting, and that had to do with um, reducing uh, compensation for the online course incentive payments. So I, I know there's interest in this, that this impacts this, if we did this, and this is not Frank's proposal, nor is it my proposal, nor is it Victor's proposal, it's an idea that, that uh, we talked about that surfaced through the budget committees that had support enough to bring to a bigger group. We didn't want to do a compensation change without having an open meeting to get input pro and con uh, on that. Um, but but here's, here's the background. Um, um, let's go to the next slide here. So, um, faculty that teach a three-hour online course get paid an incentive to do so, $55 a student. So 10 students, $550. 40 students, $2,200. Um, and over time, I mean, this practice was started probably 20 years ago, uh, when we didn't have anyone teaching online courses and not a lot of interest in it as this uh, technology was coming about. And so to get people interested in that, an incentive system was put together to do that. When Frank and I took our jobs over a little less than six years ago, we had about 4% of our credit hours were taught online. It's now gone to 16% of our credit hours are taught online. And so um, the payment in the current year that we're in, uh, when you add benefits to it, costs the university $2,165,476. And so the question was, would it make sense instead of reducing college budgets in the ways that Deans, Matthews, and Bryant talked about, could a part of that reduction be dealt with by reducing the incentive paid to online instructors who teach those courses? So, a third of our faculty teach an online course. 247 tenure or tenure track faculty plus 155 adjunct faculty for a total of 403 faculty teach an online course or more. Some teach several online courses. And so um, the scenarios here that, that we wanted your input on, uh, scenario number one is the uh, uh, current situation. Scenario number two uh, would be if you reduce the payment from $55 per student to $40 per student, that saves all things equal $590,000. If you re reduce it to $30 a student, that saves $984,000. And so if we go to the next slide, in, in scenario number one, if we say, this is a really bad idea, Cliff, this is a really bad idea to reduce faculty compensation, our faculty aren't paid at the level we want them to pay anyway. Many of them have, have uh, had this pay for a long time, and these were the people that, that began uh, teaching the courses we asked them to teach. And so if we just say this is a bad idea, and it may be, then, uh, then the deans through their budget committees are gonna work to figure out how to save $1,248,000 uh, through uh, the variety of options that they have and that they talked about. Alternative two, the $40 option <clears throat> means that you've reduced that, uh, the savings you have to find in the colleges from uh, almost in half, so that now the cut is about 0.6% or less than a percent. Uh, and all the colleges together are looking to then uh, cut $657,000. And then finally, if you reduced it to $30, then the cut is almost gone, 
and each college is now uh, um, working to save their, their share of $264,000. And so there's a trade-off. Um, unless we can think of other alternatives, obviously raising the out-of-state tuition potentially is another alternative. Um, and so scenario number four is think of something else. <laughs> now here's the deal on think of something else. You guys are going to have to work through the college budget committees to think of something else because that's kind of where we are. Um, so, so let me stop there and before we uh, officially uh, do the survey thing, let's open it up for input on this issue. So we'll bring the mics down. Here's one right up at the top, Nikki. Hello, President Smart. Um, I teach in an online uh, program that offers an online major and a minor. Uh, so a significant portion of my teaching does end up online. Um, I'm one of the faculty members who teaches multiple sections per semester. I also teach routinely in the summer. Uh, that online stipend represents about 10% of my pay. Right. And so I don't see other faculty members being asked to give up as much as I might have to give up. And it just is troubling to me. I appreciate that. And I understand that as well. Other comments? I was wondering what percentage of those online courses are taught by per course faculty and what percentage by uh, tenured or tenure track faculty because it, it seems that the per course faculty will be affected much more deeply by these cuts than tenured and tenure track faculty. So, so a, about a third of our per course faculty are teaching online. It, it's really about the same percentage. Uh, about, you know, it may, not, it may be 35 on one and 36 in another, but a little over a third of each group is teaching online. Uh, and so certainly uh, when your pay is lower to begin with uh, and you're a per course faculty and it's reduced by, uh, if it were reduced by a piece, then that might very well impact them more. That's, that's, a, that's a real point. Other comments? Uh, another quick question slash comment, if you don't mind. Um, I don't have the data in front of me, so I may be wrong, I'm, and I'm speaking from memory. It seems to me that there were concerns that at Missouri State, the number of administrative positions compared to faculty is high, and it seems to me that this is a perfect time to look at that and see if we can find any reductions in that area. So I would, I, I know there's data uh, over, uh, uh, kind of all around on that. I, I, it is my belief that that is not a true statement. And, uh, and, I, and I, would, I would share a couple of things with you um, in terms of, um, For example, none of us are, uh, are hitting our COOPA averages. Uh, now, that doesn't address the, the numbers that we have. But for example, tenured faculty are, are at 95.5% of pay, uh, non-tenured faculty 89.4, administrators 93.8, non-exempt staff 92.0. Not really anything to be proud of in any of those numbers. Uh, we're all under. Uh, in terms of the... Um, Based on our, a specific performance funding peer group, MSU spends 3.1% less than that of our peers on support services for student services, institutional support, and academic support. That translates into about uh, $12 million of lower support service costs. Uh, we've gone through, when we look at, for example, how many counselors we have in the counseling center compared to our peers, we have six, I think, and we're supposed to, you know, the average is 17. I mean, we, we can go through almost any administrative unit that we have and show that we are running a really tight and efficient uh, operation. When you look at kind of overall, back in um, um, 
back in 2007, so we're, we're talking 10 years ago, uh, and this is, this is, this is a, a statistic that, that's, that's for all of us. Um, we were getting, uh, per student, between tuition and appropriations, uh, right at $11,232 per student. The average in the nation was 15000 then if we go to 2015, the average in the nation is between tuition and appropriations, $16,000 per student. We're getting 11,403. So we were only up $172, where universities as a whole were up 1,212. And for the current year, with the reduction in state appropriations, we'll actually be getting $327 less per student than we were in 2007 before we factor in, um, before we factor in inflation. And so, um, I mean, if you have suggestions on particular administrative positions that you believe are, uh, uh, should be eliminated, I'm, ha I'm happy to have those. But I don't think the data shows that we are top heavy in terms of administrators. We have colleges that don't have assistant deans. Um, and we continue to, to work. Uh, for example, Dean Bryan has combined two of her uh, departments now to eliminate a department head position and replace it with a faculty member. And so um, since I've been here, we've added about 50 full-time faculty, and to my knowledge, we have not added any upper administrative personnel. So I just don't think the data is there. If you get data, I'm happy to look at it. You yeah, also Melissa. Had a question about the online fees. The students also have a fee associated with online classes. Has that been part of the discussion about yes. altering that? So, uh, two years or three years ago? Two years ago? At least two years ago, we raised that. So, two years ago, my, my memory is either two or three years ago, our online, um, our online students were paying $275 a credit hour. And so, we raised that to $285. I believe two years ago. That prices us above the University of Missouri Columbia for online classes. And so we did not think there was a lot of market room there to increase that uh, price this year. Thank you, President Smart, for this opportunity. Where I'm are here. We? Right here. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. I'm short, so yeah. that's why no, no, no. I, can't see I, I can relate um, to that. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I teach in the criminology department, and I just wanted to say real quick um, that there is the the in my mind, I teach online and I teach seated. I teach about evenly, and we have such a high demand for online courses. Our enrollments they always fill, they're always high. We always let students in, and th if there's any doubt in anyone's mind about how labor intensive online yeah. classes are, you can come watch me babysit a test in a 24 hour time period where I am constantly on my computer making sure there are no blackboard fails. Right. Um, it's, to me, you're gonna be asking faculty to do the same amount of work that they've been doing for less. And right. that's kind of what I wanted to say in, okay. in that consideration. Thank you, I appreciate that comment. Other comments? Hi, President Smart. I teach online classes too. I can relate to some of that sentiment, but I, I, would want, I had a question about how uh, the about 1% of our budget that we're talking about now might be reallocated if the, the, the legislature moves through with a bit brighter picture. So great question. That, that's a great question. So, so the numbers that we've been talking about were, um, uh, the governor's proposed budget. The budget that passed out of the House last week was a little better. It only had a 6.5% cut, and so that, if, if that were to become law, that would kick us back a little more than $2 million. Now, it also still had a 9% cut for the University of Missouri system, so I'm not very, I don't think it's very likely that that uh, difference in cuts is going to end up being the final piece. The, the other part of that is we don't have a history on this governor on vetoes or withhold, 
And, and so if, they, if the legislature allocates more money to higher ed than he had in his budget, he has the option to veto some of that or withhold some of that. And so um, our judgment as, a, um, as an administrative team and on the executive budget committee has been to um, create a budget based on the governor's projections. Now, if we get to, the, and the other thing I would say is we don't have a salary increase or a cost of living increase in the budget this year, because that would require us to reallocate an, an, an additional chunk of money. Um, but if we got money back, let's say that the cut was only 6.5% and we got $2.1 million that we haven't budgeted for, then we have some, some options. We can fill back in cuts. We can rehire people that have been laid off, or we could give the remaining uh, employees that are here a mid-year pay raise, or, or any other option that you want to think about. So there are a variety of things we could do um, if we have that money to spend. I think our judgment is we need to figure out how best to make those cuts now. Uh, and. You know, if the sense is, and we're going to vote in a minute, and again, the vote isn't the outcome, guys. It's not like this is a real election. It's not the outcome. <laughs> it's a piece of information that budget committees will use and factor in and talk about, right, in terms of, of what the best approach is. Um, but it's an important piece of information or we wouldn't be doing this. And so, you know, one decision could ultimately be we're not going to make any change this year. We're going to see what the budget is. Maybe money comes back, and we see what next year's budget is. You know, if we're dealing with another 10% cut a year from now, everything got a lot harder. And there are more things that are going to be on the table, including bigger tuition increases and deeper cuts in departmental budgets, et cetera. So, um, to a certain extent, because this is the first year of a new governor's administration and we don't really know how this is going to play out, we think kind of the prudent conservative thing to do is to create a budget based on his numbers. And if we get better than that, then we'll figure out how to deal with the extra funding that we have at the end. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the difficult work uh, that you and other administrators and board members have done to protect the college budgets. I don't want to underemphasize that while we discuss this issue. No, I appreciate that. Uh, second of all, um, I'm wondering where the discussions landed about um, a differential cut in the online payments based upon uh, how long people have been teaching it. In other words, incentivizing initial instruction or um, if that's uh, something that faded away and it's just going to be a across the board thing regardless of what. Uh, you, know, you know, there's there's something to be said for simplicity. On the other hand, the, the, uh, we did talk about multiple options this can be done. Um, if it's ultimately concluded that, that we're not going to make the change this year, gives us, frankly, a longer period of time to figure out should we grandfather everybody in and stop it going forward? Should it be based on how many, you know, should, should there be differential among groups? Uh, you know, I, what I don't want to do is to create a nightmare and a lot of manual work in the financial services office that eats up all the savings that we've had from doing that. Uh, but, but certainly one approach might be, okay, uh, we don't like any of these proposals. Let's go back to the drawing board and work on, you know, our, would there be ways to roll some of this into your pay and eliminate it going forward? As a, I mean, there are a whole slew of things that we could do, and, and that's a valid point. I appreciate bringing that up. President Smart. Where are we? I'm over here on your left. Yeah, Terrell. Uh, I, I appreciate the work you're doing on this. And one of your previous answers that you talked about, you were looking at, you, you cited evidence, and, and I appreciate that approach as well. Uh, as you look at the problem, I, I have two questions. One, is there any evidence to suggest that either, the, 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 as we try to squeeze out more efficiency in higher education, that the heart of the problem is either too many faculty or too high of pay for faculty. And as a second question, as we're trying to harness these incentives, you talked about, if I heard you right, 
that over your brief tenure, uh, online courses have quadrupled. Right. And so, to me, that suggests maybe this online pay is working. Right. Uh, that this bonus is working. And is there, is there any concern that cuts there might actually shoot ourselves in the foot? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, so, in answer to the first question, I don't believe that anybody that works here is overpaid, and that certainly includes faculty. And I know that. Uh, uh, as we just look at all those Coupa numbers, we don't have any category of people that are overpaid. Uh, most of our programs, if we look at the Delaware data, are in the bottom two quartiles in terms of cost. So that reflects both faculty pay and, and limited administrative uh, costs and support that goes with that. And so, no, we were on a very tight ship. I do think the incentives have worked. If you were to ask me, I have mixed feelings about whether this is a, a good proposal or not. Um, but you know, all the, all the easy answers are gone. And next year, the answers are going to be even harder. And so, hence the discussion. Um, just the, the, the goal was to get input to see, is this something we ought to be working on? Should we step back? make the cuts. We've already got it down to a reasonable number of 1.2 percent now without this. Uh, create a work group going forward to see if there's a way to, to, to over time phase it out or, or, or not, not disadvantage the people, I guess, that were the pioneers and, and really uh, uh, got this going. Or maybe we just, maybe it's something we should continue to live with and, and, and look for additional revenue. So lots of different ways we can go. Don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong answer, but there's an impact, right? If we don't do either of the, these two proposals, then there's a little harder cut to be made in each of the colleges. I think the budget committees are up for it, uh, but, but it just is a little deeper cut. So because the idea surfaced but in more than one budget committee, uh, because it impacted, frankly, 400 of our faculty members, that's the reason we're having this conversation. John? Uh, Cliff, I was in the room when Frank Einhellig, Steve Robinette, Ron Fairburn, Bruno Schmidt, Kathy Pauly all came up with the idea of the $55 incentive. How long ago was that, John? 1997. Okay. Or, or, or late 98, somewhere along there. Um, and the idea of the incentive was to recruit graduate faculty to teach graduate level courses online at a time when our faculty did not support graduate education. So I, I would suggest two possible modifications here. Okay. One is I would like to see the fee for graduate faculty teaching graduate level online courses would remain the same in recognition that there is more work involved, I think, in teaching uh, graduate students than undergraduates. Online is more work than face-to-face, -face, so I think it's consistent with the original intent of that fee, um, and that makes sense to me. And then whatever reduction we're talking about would be across uh, undergraduate level courses. And the second suggestion I have is, is why can't we say whatever reduction is going to occur is going to come back to those faculty when the budget improves? Instead of saying it's a permanent cut, we're going to ask those faculty to step up, take the hit, and when the state budget bounces back, this is going to be one of the first things that we consider to restore because that $55 is not a bonus, as somebody said, or a reward is a recognition of the extra work that is required of those faculty to teach those students. So I, I would be much more comfortable okay. saying, I, I'll kick in the cut if you will say in two, three, four years, that's the first thing we're going to look at and restore to those faculty. My, my, I appreciate both those ideas, John. My hesitancy on the second one is, I'm not sure the state budget's ever going to recover. So, so I don't want to mislead people, but I, uh, uh, we may be in for uh, a tough run of years. Uh, we'll, we'll know more next year when we see the governor's second budget because he says that he is supportive of higher education and that there, he believes that 
excellence should be uh, funded and at the same time he believes there are inefficiencies and things that should be eliminated from higher education and so we're working to do that first piece in higher ed all across the state and so we'll uh, I think time will tell next year in terms of what budgets are going to look like as we go forward uh, thank you for those suggestions David um, yeah I have uh, two questions I guess okay. uh, quickly um, I calculated out uh, I, I'm re many uh, faculty who teach online probably do it out of choice uh, and the incentive is good and supports that and especially at the college at the graduate level uh, I, I'm required to teach online and so uh, I, uh, a typical semester starting this fall, uh, would, I would gain about $4,400 addition, uh, additional compensation. Uh, cutting that $55 basically means that I'm taking a pay cut. Right. Uh, and so that, that amounts to about 7% of my salary. So, so the question is rel relating to that, uh, are administrators across the university willing to take a 7% pay cut <laughs> to help us out? <laughs> And the other is uh, the other question had to do with: Has anyone discussed uh, potential savings if all administrators taught at least one course? Um, I don't know how many of our administrators teach a course uh, or not. Um, I've not calculated that. Uh, have not asked uh, any of our employees in any category to take a seven percent pay cut. If we were going to do an across-the-board pay cut, we'd do it for. 100% of, uh, of our workforce, I presume. Um, but anyway, thank you for those comments. Others? Yeah, up here. Thank you. Um, the online tuition is $80 per credit hour higher. And the faculty get per credit hour $18.33, and with fringe, that's about $25. So the differential there is about $80. Uh, I mean, 60, sorry, 60. Um, are we con convinced that this is revenue neutral if the incentive is cut? Or if the incentive is cut, will the online output go down and negate any savings from cutting the compensation? So I think that was Terrell's point, uh, one of Terrell point earlier and uh, so exactly if, if our online production went down uh, from 16 to 12 percent of our classes then the result of that would be that we would not achieve the full savings the full savings on the charts are assuming that we have the same level of uh, online courses offered with the same number of students in them let's uh, wrap up a couple last thoughts here yeah, first Jeff? of all, I, I would like to say uh, this is my third university that I've been at, the third time I've been through the budget cutting process. And, and I really think that, that uh, Missouri State does a great job with this. The transparency and everything has been, been very good. In particular, with regard to the online payment, I would echo uh, Dr. Reagan's comments regarding whether or not this would, in fact, be revenue neutral. I can tell you from a scheduling standpoint that we are often forced to, to, to leave those online caps really low to save place for online students so that the sections just don't get incredibly enormous. If we just opened them up, we would have easily enough demand to offer one or two more online sections. So I've never heard since I've been here, we have too many online classes, okay? And I think cutting the incentive to participate in online classes could be a, uh, a mistake in the long run. Good, thank you, Jeff. All right, let's, uh, why don't we go to the voting piece? I think, uh, I think we've gotten lots of issues out on the, f on the table. So, turn off your Wi-Fi. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, domain you wanna uh, type into your phone or tablet. So let's first identify who you are. Put yourself in a category. It's working. Gosh. <laughs> Technology is great when it works, isn't it?
If anybody's having trouble, we have lots of helpers. You can raise your hand and somebody will come help you. Anybody need more time? All right, last 10 seconds. If you need more time, raise your hand. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so that, that helps us uh, know who's in the room when we see the vote. So let's go to the uh, uh, second question. Okay, so only expense reductions, that's option one. One of the incentives, option two or three, find something else, option four. All right, last 15 seconds. Last five seconds, I just saw another vote come up. All right, done, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do now, if, if people are tired of this, they can leave if they want to, but I'm happy to now answer questions on any other subject. Do you have a question? Keyshore has a question. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I was reading the news. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Mike coming. Thank you. Thank you. I was reading the news leader today about the field hockey matter, and I read a sentence which is something like this. None of the administrators went to the field hockey game. So my question is, the field hockey team has been cut. Why did not sufficiently many members from your administrative team, members from the athletic budget committee, various deans, who pretty much love sports. Why did they not go to the field hockey game where 11 of our women students were playing? So, so I think that criticism is directed at me and our athletic director, and that's fair. But here's what else was going on. Uh, on Friday, Wichita State announced they were leaving the Missouri Valley Conference tournament. And so on Saturday and Sunday, the Missouri Valley Conference had a President's Athletic Director series of meetings in St. Louis to begin working on who is going to replace Wichita in that league, whether it's one, two, or three teams or some other amount of teams. I've been asked to lead that committee. Each of us thought it was very important that we attend those meetings because the future of our athletic conferences and our other 15 teams that play in the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament is at stake. 
That's why Kyle and I were not at that game. Otherwise, we would have been at the game. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, great input, great discussion. Uh, thanks for coming today. The committees will take this input and, and move forward. Very